Okay, six period sociology. We have finished up uh, our section on um, the five main theories of sociology. And so we're going to look at how each of those theories actually works in terms of um, making observations and uh, studying people in society. And the first one that we're going to look at today is called positivism. Uh, positivism soci or positivist sociology is highly related uh, to structural and functional sociology. It's where it's an early form of sociology where uh, sociologists believe that they could scientifically measure everything in society and be highly accurate about that. Um, so they could make some observations and they could say this from a definitive standpoint is what is going on. Um, and so how is it that they're gonna do this positivism where they're gonna observe things scientifically? Um, well, what kind of things are they going to measure? Uh, what kind of things are they going to study? Uh, first one, are poor people more likely than the rich to break the law? If you go and you actually measure how many people are arrested uh, from each of the social classes in the United States and divide that uh, the social classes down monetarily, um, you find that poor people are no more likely uh, than the rich to break the law. It's simply the fact that some of the crimes that are committed uh, uh, might be more sensationalized and in our minds, we believe that to be true. Uh, second one is the, Uni the United States, a middle class society in which most people are more or less equal. Well, if we scientifically look at the income levels of Americans and how many things that we own, uh, very quickly we realize that a rather small percentage of people in American society owns almost all of the income and owns almost all of the wealth. And a lot of people in society have zero wealth whatsoever. Uh, do most poor people not want to work? If you look at employment data, you find that many poor people are what we'd call working poor, uh, where they are working two and three jobs and, in fact, are working, quote unquote, harder than many people that are up the income scale. And finally, do people marry because they fall in love? When we go and we look at the reasons when you ask people, why did you get married? and you do survey research, what, what you find out is that uh, there a lot of times there are commonalities of social class, of religion, and race, uh, all those things, education, that are reasons why people get married rather than falling in love. So um, how is it that we're going to apply scientific method to sociology? Well, some of these terms are going to be very familiar to you. So we're going to use theories in sociology and we're going to say why are certain facts related and um, what kind of explanation do they offer for things that are going on. The second one here is really important. Um, a lot of the scientific data that is gathered is using concepts. And that's where we take the world, we take some very, very complex uh, human interaction and we basically put it in simplified form and attempt to explain it. Now, a lot of students and, by the way, a lot of early positivist sociologists didn't think of these things, these theories, in terms of them being con conceptual. They thought of them in terms of fact. I would urge you, I would absolutely <laughs> exhort you uh, to think of these things conceptually because if you don't and you accept them as truth, uh, then what you're accepting is an, a way oversimplified explanation of things that are going on. Today, uh, we're gonna be looking at the concept of variables. Um, and variables are simply uh, something that you can measure in positivist sociology. Um, and it's something that changes uh, from person to person, place to place, time to time. Uh, or case to case. And in positivist sociology, a lot of times you have to take things that are highly conceptual 
And then you have the challenge of actually trying to measure that. Um, the way that positivist sociology sociologists measure things is by using uh, what are called operational definitions. That's where you take a term that is not intent. It's a con concept. It's not intended to be measured, but you go ahead and you figure out a way to measure it. So let's take the term happy. Um, how can we measure happiness? Um, happiness is a concept. If you ask an American, happiness is that uh, form of basically exuberance that comes with a really great day or really great time. That's happiness. That's how we would define happiness. If you ask the pers a person from Denmark what's happy, it's happy is a sense of contentment where things didn't go nearly as bad as what you thought they were going to do, and you're doing better than you thought you would, that's happy, okay? So happiness is a definition. So if you want to measure it, you have to be very specific, and you can say, we are going to measure happiness using a happiness scale that is established by a survey that people are going to take um, that measures happiness in terms of how do you feel compared to other people in your society, all right? So how would you uh, operationalize some of these other variables? Well, we already looked at happiness, but how would you measure greed? You know, one person's merely took a little too much as another person's absolute greediness. How do you measure laziness? One person might be like, uh, think that one thing represents laziness um, where it might not be that extreme. And to another person, to be truly lazy, you have to do something off the wall or something like religiousness. Uh, you'll be introduced to this wonderful term in this class called religiosity. Um, but how religious are you? If you're saying, boy, that guy's religious or that lady's religious, um, how do you do that? You have to have a way to measure Okay, so we're going to practice this. Um, we're going to do an exercise where you guys are going to look at some operational definitions. Um, so for each of these statements that are here, you and a partner or partners in the case of one group of three here, and I already have on this slide who you're going to be working with, you are going to take this statement you're going to have to identify the terms in the statements that need to be operationalized or need to have an operational definition so we can measure it. That's one part of it. And then the second, we're going to provide a operational definition of that so it can be measured and so that other people can then go and look at what we've done once we do a study and they can critique it based on, do we agree with your operational definition? I'm going to pop out of here real quick. And I have the second example down there. The more languages you know, the easier it is for you to learn a new one. All right. So what is it that you need to operationalize? Well, first thing is, what constitutes a language? We better know that. Second thing. Oh, wow. That was... Uh, not a particularly great way to do that. So let's try again. All right. The second one is the word know. Uh, what does it mean to know something? Um, what does it mean to be easy to do something? How is it something easier um, than something else? And then finally, what constitutes learning? Um, those are things that are concepts, learning, What's a language? How do you know something? What's easy? What's not easy? So here we go. For a language, I operationalize that. And you can, this is the point where you can disagree, okay? But as long as you, when you do a study, as long as you're just saying, hey, that's how I'm measuring, I chose the World Health Organization's six, they call them the big six languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. Uh, if you know more of those, uh, of the big six, then when you add another one, it's going to be easier. Speaking of the word know, 
what does it mean that I know a language? Uh, to me, I've measured that I can converse, I can read, and I can write um, with a native speaker in that language. All right. Um, the third thing that needs to be operationalized is the word easier. What, what does it mean to be easier? And I operationalize that numerically. It takes at least 10% less time using standard time measurements. So uh, milliseconds, seconds, uh, hours, days, weeks, et cetera, standard time measurement. 10% less standard time than somebody that does not that knows less languages. Um, you also could quibble with me and say, you need to operationalize the term more. Um, are we gonna have a definite number for that? Uh, and finally, uh, the term learn. What does it mean to learn? And here we're saying learning is being given instruction in the language by the same exact teacher and progress toward our definition of knowing, which is we can converse, read, and write with a native speaker in that language. Um, that's how we're gonna measure those things. So here you have a very simple statement. The more languages you know, the easier it is for you to learn a new one. And we have made it very complex, but at the same time, hopefully we'll be able to study it. Um, so that is how um, we are going to do that. And you guys have a partner. Um, when you come in on Monday, um, you are going to share what it is that you have done with your partner. And so that ends today's work. <laughs>